So the second reading is from Exodus chapter 10, verses 29, 21 to 29, which if you've got the church Bible is on page 91. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the sky so that darkness spreads over Egypt, darkness that can be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky and total darkness covered all Egypt for three days. No one could see anyone else or move about for three days. Yet all the Israelites had light in the places where they lived. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and said, go, worship the Lord. Even your women and children may go with you. Only leave your flocks and herds behind. But Moses said, you must allow us to have sacrifices and burnt offerings to present to the Lord our God. Our livestock too must go with us. Not a hoof is to be left behind. We have to use some of them in worshipping the Lord our God. And until we get there, we will not know what we are to use to worship the Lord. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he was not willing to let them go. Pharaoh said to Moses, Get out of my sight. Make sure you do not appear before me again. The day you see my face, you will die. Just as you say, Moses replied, I will never appear before you again. Oh, thanks for that. And um, how good was Mark as calling that um, boxing? New skills. Um, keep, uh, yeah, please keep that part of the Bible open. We're looking at a big section of Exodus today, beginning in chapter five. Uh, let me let me pray uh, for us. Uh, Father God, we um, yes, yeah, we come to you now, and uh, Lord, as we come to your Word, uh, then we ask that you would please be reminding us of your goodness to us and your grace, uh, which acts in the world to save. And uh, we pray that there might be something that helps us better live for you. Amen. Well, um, we've heard already that today's passage really is about a, a big showdown, isn't it? Um, one example that comes to mind for me was in the 1997 NBA Finals. The Utah Jazz were playing the Chicago Bulls. And uh, with nine seconds to go, the game was tied. And uh, Utah's forward, Carl Malone, had two free throw attempts to win the game. Um, Carl Malone's nickname was the mailman because he always delivered. And uh, so he was expected to make at least one of those free throws uh, and win the game. But Scotty Pippen walked past him and made one of the greatest, uh, or stated one of the greatest sporting sledges of all time. Uh, the game uh, was being played on a Sunday. And as Pippen walked past, he simply said, the mailman doesn't come on Sundays. Uh, that got into uh, Carl Malone's head and he missed both free throws. And then Michael Jordan stole the game on the buzzer. Uh, and you can catch all of that history if you watch The Last Dance. Now, it was a great moment uh, in NBA history. And for those uh, two great teams, I mean, really the question was, who is going to come out on top? And who is going to be able to deliver? Who's going to come through with the goods? There'd been a lot of talk up until that point. Uh, but when crunch time came, who was going to be able to deliver? Now, of course, we do come to this great uh, showdown here today in the book of Exodus. Um, over the last couple of weeks, we've been seeing of how God's people, Israel, uh, are greatly oppressed as slaves in Egypt. Uh, we've heard God speaking about how he's going to rescue his people, uh, how he's heard the cries of his people. Uh, we heard last week about how God uh, rescued Moses and called him to be the leader of his people. And where we're up to today now really is crunch time. Will God come through for his people? Will he keep his promises and bring his people out of Egypt? And so it's really this quite famous section of the book of Exodus, this uh, series of 10 plagues. Um, and I think the question is, who will prove more powerful? Uh, that's what we're thinking about today. And uh, we are looking at a bigger section, chapter 5 uh, through to chapter 11. Um, which means we won't look at all of the details. Um, but as we begin, well, as we come to chapter five, I think uh, we really see quite a slow start. Uh, and so I've given chapter five the heading uh, in your newsletter there, when God seems slow to act. Because where we got to last week, um, God had just called Moses to be the leader of his people. 
Um, he'd appeared to Moses in the burning bush. Uh, he'd spoken to him and commissioned him. Um, but now as Moses and Aaron go and do what God instructed as they go to Pharaoh, well, see what happens here from verse 1 of chapter 5. It says, Afterward, uh, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. But then here's Pharaoh's response. He says in verse 2, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord and I will not let Israel go. Bit of a false start. Um, now it is worth noticing, I think, that Moses probably is... He comes across as a bit overconfident at this point and maybe taking things a bit into his own hands. Um, he hasn't done exactly what God instructed him uh, back in chapter 3. So God had said to Moses to take the elders of Israel with him. Uh, he hasn't done that. He's just, it's just him and Aaron. And I think the tone also has kind of stepped up a bit. It's the request has really grown into much more of a command. Let my people go. And what originally God had said would be a three-day journey has now morphed into this endless feast in the wilderness. So it's probably not surprising the way that Pharaoh responds the way he does. And I'm sure that would have knocked a bit of confidence out of Moses. But he and Aaron then speak again in verse 3. They said, the God of Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God or he may strike us with plagues or with the sword. So I think the request does get toned down a bit there. But then really what we hear through the rest of chapter 5 um, that was read for us earlier, I mean, is really this uncompromising stance from Pharaoh. In fact, Pharaoh is quite keen to show them exactly who's boss. And he does that here by making life harder and harder for the Israelites. And so he gives this order in verse 6 for the slave drivers uh, to make the Israelites make the same amount of bricks to do the same labour, but now they have to gather the straw in the, on their own rather than having it supp supplied. And so this is the, the result. The result of this first encounter is not deliverance, but it is further oppression, which of course means the Israelites are quite upset with Moses. So jump over to verse 20 there, you see their reaction. It says, when they left uh, Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them. And they said, may the Lord look on you and judge you. You have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in the hand to kill us. So that's how the Israelites respond. But then how does Moses feel about all of this? Well, verse 22 is what he now says to the Lord. He says, why, Lord, have you brought trouble on these people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on these people and you have not rescued your people at all. Seems like round one goes to Pharaoh, doesn't it? And I think we can understand here how Moses feels. God has made these promises to deliver his people but so far, things are just getting worse and worse. And we might wonder, I mean, well, what is God doing? And he doesn't appear to be doing anything at this point. His people are suffering. So it's no wonder that Moses is feeling confused and upset because God seems to him to be absent or maybe just powerless to help. And so I think that may be something that we can relate to, that feeling of when uh, God maybe has spoken clearly about his purposes to, to bless and to care for his people. But when the circumstances around us just seem to tell a different story. And we might wonder, well, why is our experience of God often like that? I don't think we'll always know the reasons why. <clears throat> But one thing I, I do think we see here in this chapter is that God is uh, teaching Moses something. And uh, I think often that might be the case for us as well, that God is uh, doing this transforming work in us, shaping us, refining us as his people. 
I think in this chapter at the beginning, we see Moses may be a bit full of his own pride. But later on in Exodus, we'll read how Moses is described as the most humble man on earth. Now that transformation uh, takes a bit of knocking the edges off, doesn't it? And uh, <clears throat> that kind of change in character only takes place as God does his work in us and teaches us to depend on him through all of the ups and downs of life. Now, what we also see is that God is, of course, faithful to what he's promised. His timing might not be our timing, but he, he will do what he has promised. So having promised that he will deliver his people, well, that's what we now see beginning from chapter 6. So in chapter 6, uh, this is how the Lord uh, now responds to Moses. Uh, in verse 1, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, uh, now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. So this is what God has promised and he's not going to go back on his word. He will deliver his people. But again, it doesn't start straight away. And initially the way that God responds is not by uh, taking away the people's suffering or difficulty, but first by reminding them of his promises. So first of all, God reminds them of verse, in verse 2 that he is the God of their fathers in whom they can trust. In verse 5, he reminds them how he has heard their cries and how he will act in accord with what he has promised to bless them, to free them, to bring them into a good land. And in this chapter, I think we do see we're really in this whole section, I think we do see some of God's big purposes being revealed. And the first is that through his salvation, that his name would be made known. So in verse 7, you see that? He says, I will take you as my own people and I will be your God and then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. This is one of the big purposes of God, that everyone would know his name, would know his salvation. And as God acts in the world, well, it won't just be his own people who know him, but now if you come over to um, verse 5 of chapter 7, uh, Moses, uh, he's, again, he's speaking to Moses and he says this, he says, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. So here's one of God's big purposes in the world, and he will bring it about. That one day all people will know his name. And some will know him as saviour. Some, like we see here in the Egyptians, some will simply know him as Lord. But that is the picture that we're given of the day when Jesus returns. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And as God now works in the world for salvation, well, his great desire is that none should perish, but that all should come to know him as Saviour. And so that leads then to the second thing that God wants to bring about, which is that his people would know him and rely on him as their only hope. And certainly that is the case for God's people here. I mean, they're, they're stuck in slavery and it's just getting worse and worse. There's no possible way that they can set themselves free. Um, and the Israelites aren't really up for it themselves. And if you look at um, verse 7 of chapter 7, we're told about the ages of Moses and Aaron. They're both in their 80s, probably not exactly in the prime of their life to lead a battle uh, against Egypt. And so what we're, the picture we're given here is that if God's people are going to be delivered, it's going to be by his miraculous intervention. Now, of course, for us as well, as we think about how this applies to us, who spiritually are not, not just trapped in slavery, but we are, as Paul says in Ephesians, we are dead in our sins. And so it is only the mercy of God. He is our only hope. The good news is that where we are weak and powerless, God in his mercy is powerful to save. And really that is the big dominant picture through the next chapters. 
um, which show us God's power to deliver Israel from Egypt through this series of plagues. And um, I think these chapters are presented to us as like this contest between the Lord and, uh, and Pharaoh um, and, and the gods of Egypt. And although Pharaoh will resist and uh, time and time again, he'll go back on his word, well, eventually Pharaoh will be forced to submit and release God's people. Now, there is lots in these chapters. It's great that we've watched the video because we've all already sort of flown over it in a, in a sense. Um, and that's really what we're going to do um, for the rest of our time, just to get a, the, the big idea of what's going on in these chapters. Um, but firstly, we see in chapter 7 again, um, pick it up there from verse 10. We see here how uh, Moses and Aaron go back to Pharaoh. And it says this, so Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron threw his staff down in front of Pharaoh and his officials and it became a snake. Pharaoh then summoned wise men and sorcerers and the Egyptian magicians also did the same things by their secret arts. Each one threw down his staff and it became a snake. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Yet Pharaoh's heart became hard and he would not listen to them just as the Lord had said. Let me just pick up on a couple of things there. I mean, this is kind of the introduction to this big showdown that's going to follow and uh, the throwing down of the staff. I mean, that was uh, one of the signs that God had given to Moses. Um, Moses did that before the Israelite um, people and that meant that they believed. Um, but as he does it now before Pharaoh, well, Pharaoh's own magicians are able to replicate it. We're told that they do that by their own secret arts. Now, in ancient Egypt, the symbol of um, Egypt's power and Pharaoh's power was the snake or the serpent. You've probably all seen you know, pictures of uh, Pharaoh's, I don't know if it's a crown or just some kind of headdress, but with a snake on it. That's the symbol of his power. And of course, in the Bible, I mean, the serpent is the symbol of the ultimate enemy of God's people. But here as this showdown begins, well, Aaron's staff, which turns into a serpent, it, uh, it swallows up the other ones belonging to Pharaoh's magicians. And so if this is like the introduction to the showdown, well, it's fairly clear what that implies about whose power is going to prevail. Now, another line of thought to track through these chapters is these statements about Pharaoh's heart. So you see there in verse 13, um, we just read there, it says that Pharaoh's heart became hard. And what that means is that his heart is stubborn toward God and doesn't listen or obey God. Now, at some point through the plagues that follow, it will say that Pharaoh hardens his own heart. At other points, it will say that God is the one who hardens Pharaoh's heart. So it raises this question for us of who is responsible. And I think in Exodus, I think the question is never answered in a simple way. Instead, we're shown that both of these things are true. We're shown the absolute sovereignty of God, even over people's hearts. But we're shown that Pharaoh, like us, is responsible for his actions. Both of those things are, are true. And what we also see is how God is sovereignly at work in all of these things to bring about his good plans and purposes in the world and that he uses even the evil intentions of the human heart to bring about his salvation and so we see god's sovereignty we see human action and responsibility and within that we see god's purposes to save. now realize we still haven't got to the plague so let's um jump into that they begin uh, properly from verse 14 of uh, chapter 7 uh, Moses confronts Pharaoh on the bank of the river, uh, which is an interesting location, uh, given that Moses was himself delivered there as a baby. Uh, but Moses speaks to Pharaoh, warns him about what's going to happen. Uh, then Aaron stretches out his staff and all of the water in the Nile turns to blood. And fish die and no one's able to drink it and the river stinks. It reminds me of one year in a drought. It's a bit hard to imagine a drought today, isn't it? But, you know, we had a dam on the farm uh, that just got lower and lower. I mean, it was full of fish. And fish all died. And it stank. And it was horrible. And this is what happens in Egypt. 
how does Pharaoh react to this? We're told there in verse 22, it says, and Pharaoh's heart became hard. He would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. And so that's plague number one, but there's going to be 10 of them. And um, here's a picture that shows all of them in order. Um, you might like to just uh, skim over the headings uh, in your Bible. So it begins there in chapter 7 with the turning of the river into blood. Uh, but then following that, there's this uh, plague of frogs. Frogs are everywhere, even in their beds. And it's worse than cane toads in Queensland. Now that's followed by gnats uh, and then flies. Um, and then in chapter 9, this plague on the livestock, of all the livestock of the Egyptians die. After that, the plagues begin to affect the people um, themselves. And so the Egyptians are covered in boils. And then there's this hail that's you know, the worst storm that Egypt has ever seen and it kills the trees. And then it's locusts who eat everything. So there's not a plant left. Um, and then there's uh, darkness uh, from 1021. And it's, uh, we read that section before. And uh, darkness covers the land for three days. And uh, no one can see. And it's, it's described there as a darkness that can be then uh, in chapter 11, uh, we won't see it this week carried out, but we see the warning of it, the final plague on the firstborn. That the firstborn son in Egypt will die. Following that, well, God's firstborn son, Israel, will be set free. Now, as we skim over that, I mean, what are we to learn from the series of plagues? I just want to pick up on a couple of things to finish and to see again how this really relates to God's big purposes of what he's doing in the world. And, and one key verse, I think, right in the middle of this section, so if you come back to chapter 9 and verse 13, uh, we see one of God's big purposes of him, that he would be made known. So 9 verse 13 says this, then it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, uh, get up early in the morning. This is just before the, the hail. Uh, get up early in the morning, confront Pharaoh and say to him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says, let my people go so that they may worship me. Or this time I will send the full force of my plagues against you and against your officials and your people so that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. For now, I could have, by now I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague that would have wiped you off the earth. But I have raised you up for this very purpose that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. And so what does that tell us about God's big purposes and why he's acting in the world to save? It's that his name would be known that the whole earth would know the name of the Lord, which we thought about last week, that name Yahweh, that name of Saviour. This is what God is demonstrating. It's what he's showing, that he is a saviour to all who will trust in him. That is God's big purpose in the world, to create a people for himself, where he will be their God, they will be his people. And so we see God acting in the world to bring about his good purposes. Uh, we thought about that two weeks ago. We're reminded as we began this series in Exodus of uh, the promises that God made to Abraham to rescue his people, to bring them into a, a good land, uh, to make them numerous, to bless them, uh, so that they would bring God's blessings to the end of the earth. Because ultimately, this is God's purpose, to bring blessings. And really, I think what we see in the plagues is the exact opposite. What we see in the plagues is really everything that God intends for his world and the creation tipped upside down and thrown into chaos. So if we ask the question, I mean, what would it look like if God withdrew himself and stopped blessing the world, stopped being the good and sovereign ruler of our world? Well, the answer is it would look like these chapters. Because, see, that's what Pharaoh asked for. He asked for a world without God, and that's what God gives him. Instead of a world where the waters are gathered together to provide life, 
they become a source of death. Instead of the good world that God created where all of the living creatures are in the right place, well, they're all in the wrong place. God gives Pharaoh a world where livestock die instead of multiplying, where humanity suffers rather than flourishes, a world where hail destroys the trees, where every green plant disappears. It's a world that, where darkness replaces light, a world where there is death instead of life. A world where judgment will fall on those who refuse to acknowledge the Lord as their Savior. That is what Pharaoh is asking for as he turns away from the Lord. But even in giving Pharaoh over to this kind of world, we, we still see through these chapters God's grace to him. Each time Pharaoh says enough, God relents and he restores. Because ultimately, God's purposes are not for destruction and judgment and plague, but for life and freedom and blessing. And we know that is his desire because that is the world he created. And because that is the world <clears throat> that he is now, through his son, reconciling to himself. Friends, God has good plans and purposes for the world which he loves. Now, we've been reminded of that today, of how God intervened to show his power, to show his salvation over Pharaoh in Egypt. And, of course, we are to see in this a pointer to the ultimate salvation, the way that God intervened to display his power to defeat the ultimate enemy so that we sinners might go free. And so for us today, if you take something away from these chapters, I hope you might be reminded that we trust in the Lord, who is our, our good saviour, who is our deliverer, and he continues to work out his good plans and purposes in the world. If you're here today and uh, maybe you haven't yet decided uh, how you will respond to this, well, the encouragement of the New Testament is that you would not resist like Pharaoh, but instead that if you hear his voice, that you would not harden your heart, but come to him and trust in the one who has delivered his people from their sins. Let me uh, pray for us. And um, then if you're in the teenage group, you can come out with me. Uh, but let me, let me pray as we finish. Our Father God, we're reminded today that you are a, a great and powerful God. We're reminded as well that you are a good God who wants to bring blessing and salvation to the ends of the earth. And Father, we thank you for the deliverance that has been displayed and is freely offered to all who will trust in you and your salvation and your son, Jesus. And it's in his great name that we pray.